it, it shut okay. off. Okay, go. I'm sorry. Hello, everyone. Today is December the 9th, and, uh, 2020, and thanks for joining in to NAWA Florida virtual workshops. Today, we're honored to have our member, board member, Muffy Clark Gill, uh, talk about different techniques of rozong, which is a Japanese style batik, and the batik as we know it, the traditional one. And uh, she traveled to, to Uganda while in high school, and that's where she got motivated to work on this technique. And she's uh, exhibited extensively. She has a very impressive biography, and her body of work is very diverse, and she's mastered the art of batik making. So, um, Mafi, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. So I have, as, as Annabelle said, I've had a long history with petite going all the way back to high school. So let me just, let, let's go, it all started here. So when I was in high school, my mother and I were invited to go with a friend to Uganda, which is a, a country in East Africa next door to Kenya for people who don't know where it is. So we visited the country for two weeks and while I was there, I saw an exhibition on batik. It was a display of batik lampshades, wall hangings, and I got really interested. And I said, gee, you know, I really, um, I would like to learn more about this. So I actually came back and talked to my Girl Scout troop into trying batik and doing a crayon batik. And that was one of my first ones. And when we get done to the presentation, I'll show you this first one that I did that won an award. It was in high school for the Scholastic Art Award. So it was just kind of funny. So from there, I got interested in batik over the years. But I, um, I had put it down for a while. And then when I graduated college, I started taking it up again. I really missed it and started playing around with it. And it, in meanwhile, I have always been fascinated with fabric and fiber. And five years ago for our 30th wedding anniversary, we were fortunate enough to fall into a little windfall that allowed us to travel for a month in Asia. So we started off flying to Seoul where we spent a couple nights in Seoul as a transition stop, but I was able to go to the National Folk Art Museum of Korea, which really was fun. And then we moved on down to Myanmar. And I, I wanted to go there before I got totally overrun with American tourists. And fortunately, I'm glad I did at the time because now you can't really go there. But I just loved Myanmar and loved the fashions. And one of the things that we went to was a town on Lake Inle, which is in central Myanmar, where they specialize in weaving and making fibers from lotus blossoms, lotus leaves. They would snap the, they would snap the, the blooms and said, this is a man spinning the yarn that goes into the lotus blossom. And this woman is snapping the stems of the lotus plant and then she pulls them apart to make the threads that they go back and do in that iCat style weaving. And you can see here the threads being spun. And these were some of the dyes that they were using. They were using organic dyes. And I, the dyes that I use for my work now are Japanese dyes. Uh, they come direct from Japan. They have um, much brighter color than American dyes. So when I see other people using dye, I'm always interested in seeing how they're making them. And this was just a really fun scene. And there's a woman dipping the fabric, her fabric in the dye. And from that trip, we flew from Myanmar to Singapore and boated, boarded a cruise boat for 10 days to, and cruised around the coast of Indonesia. And that was another big influence because it was number one on my list. I had to go to Indonesia because most of the world's batik comes from the area of Java. And it also was done in Bali, but we, I unfortunately didn't get to the town of Jogjakarta, which is a big batik hub, but I got to see batik being done in other areas. And the painting, the photograph you're looking at right now is, uh, I ended up using as a basis for another painting that I won an award with. But 
I am just, I love color. And I just, the thing I love most about Indonesia was the amount of color that I saw around me, looking in the markets, looking at fabric. This is the display of fabric, batik fabrics in the market. And, you know, you just look at it, it's just a, a rainbow of designs and colors. And after we got off the boat, we were able to uh, go in and see some batik factories. So this is a batik factory on Bali. And the man at the bottom there is using a stamp called a Jap and printing hot wax on the fabric. It's got a pad on the table underneath it. And on above him are another Jap and some of the tools that they use. Now these tools are called jantings or cantings. And you can see how they've got little spouts on them, but I'll show you more in a sec. But the upper right, you can see more of these prints. So when you see uh, batik fabrics in a store on clothing, they are all printed. Usually the, the janting work is done by women and the printing is done by men. Here's a close up of another Jap. And you see these are all custom made. They're made with copper wire so they absorb the heat when they're dipped in the wax. And here are the ladies in the factory who they drape their fabric over these stands and then hold it in their lap and use the janting tool to draw with. And this is just a diagram board they had in one of the factories to show you how they progress to make a finished image. So you can see they're starting with a line drawing and gradually adding wax and fatigue is a layering process. So you have to plan and think in advance. You have to start with your lightest color and then add colors and wax over each layer to hold the color until you get to your final design. And then we visited this wonderful shop in Ubud where it was all fair trade. Uh, they had a woman's group that this woman who owned the shop who's in the picture on the right uh, in, paid these women to have a trade and they were making these wonderful indigo fabrics with batik printing and with clamp printing. So my husband bought this wonderful shirt that he's modeling here. And I love indigo too. So it leads on to other things here. But we also went back after we left Bali, we flew to Java, back to Java and went to, to Jakarta. And they have a national textile museum in Jakarta. So we were thrilled to go through. It's basically two old uh, plantation house, 19th century uh, noble houses. But they, um, they have a workshop in the back of the main building where you can take petite classes. And there was this lady in the picture here was visiting from Canada and, and was born in Indonesia. And she's working on a piece there. But among their students, you can see Michelle Obama came because uh, actually uh, Barack went to school about two miles away from where the museum was. So we stopped and visited the school where Barack Obama started elementary school. So they visited back, I guess it was like 2009, 2010, and Michelle learned how to do batik. And this is at the workshop, you can see that the man is taking out a piece that's already been dyed. Those are all dye tanks. And then they had this diagram, this picture on the right is one of the entry posts going into that workshop. And then on the left, you can see all the different kinds of jantings that the Indonesians use to do their drawing and painting. And I'm going to stick, while we're talking about this, I'm going to stick my janting in hot wax. So we. I don't understand. What is this? Uh, canting? This is a drawing. It is a drawing tool. On, the drawing tools on the left. And the one on the right is a giant freestanding stylized janting. Oh, it's There's just a, a pair a of them. It, a it's a decorative, it's a decorative sculpture at the entrance of the museum. So there's two of them. There's that what they flank the entrance to this workshop area, which is behind it. And then this is the front, the front part of the building. So this is another old house that they've turned into a boutique gallery. And on the upper right there, they have all these antique wall hangings that uh, they've collected from all over the country that are traditional boutique. 
And then they, the fun thing about batik is in, in Indonesia, a uh, casual Friday is called batik Friday. So everybody wears a batik shirt or batik clothing. So one of the fun things, they took us to a department store that featured Indonesian crafts. And three floors of this five-story building were all devoted to batik. So the one on the left, is actually a coffee bean pattern on a tie. And then you can see the beautiful shirt on the right. And then the one below it is another sample of very stylized traditional batik. And you can see more, here's more pieces of traditional batik using more indigo colors. And the fact that, you know, here you got a department store with sale on different items is just kind of fun. So, I still wanted to pursue my interest in indigo and other coloring. So last year, I went with a group of 18 women to a little town that's 90 minutes by train from Tokyo. And that is the home of Brian Whitehead. He is a Canadian expat who teaches indigo and shibori and katazomi, which is uh, another form of resist printing at his 100 and 30 year old studio. But before we got to his home, he took us on a tour of some ancient fabrics in antique Japanese. We went to two different Japanese antique shops and looked at the fabrics there and looked at the patterns and the processes so we could learn about how shibori was done. And then, then we spent 10 days at his farmhouse. So this is a 130 year old farmhouse that he fixed up. And we had. I'd say about 12 students in the main house and then six of us were in a house down the road from it. And then Brian, that's Brian on the left, he was teaching us about indigo. So this is an, in, a natural indigo vet. He grows some of his own indigo and he also buys some other leaves from other growers and makes, this is the flower that you see knowing that the indigo is working and it's ready for dying. And we learned, how to not in, and sew different pieces of shibori. And you can see here, we finished dyeing the pieces on the bottom right there. They're hanging on a clothesline to dry after they'd gone through several dippings. And then he took us down the hill to this water course where we had to literally wash out the excess dye out of fabric and hit them against the rocks to remove more dye. And the people on the left, after all my classmates and we're all sitting there cutting all the threads loose from the pieces we were creating with the indigo. But part of the fun thing is he took us to a katazomi studio and katazomi is another form of resist just like batik. And instead of using wax, they use paste. So this katazomi studio um, is just in a, a suburb of Tokyo and it's been seven generations of katazomi artists, artisans. And they create, the, the bottom right picture there, you'll see it's, the, it's a rice paste that they spread on, the, on a stencil. So part of the process is, is cutting stencils. And that's the owner of the shop. He's holding a, a traditional stencil that is laid on top of these boards that have the fabric glued to the boards with rice paste. And then he takes the rice paste and pastes it over the stencil work. And you can see, then they take the boards outside to dry before they apply the dyes. And you can see there, there he is doing, he's applying the paste. And then we all had, as part of our homework, we had to make our own stencils for this project. So I was used to cutting stencils for, for Japanese batik. So to give you a heads up, uh, the Japanese batik is called rosome. You can call it rosome, but it's rosome. And it's just, everybody forgets what it is. So I just tell them that basically it's Japanese batik. It's easier to <laughs> remember. But there I'm um, pasting, I'm using the paste they made for me and I'm pasting my own designs. What is the material you use for And the then vessel? we had to take the- Muffy? What is the- uh, This, it, what that piece, yeah, it, it's a mulberry paper. Mulberry and paper? it's a mulberry paper that is treated. Yeah, they have a synthetic paper now that most people are using, but the traditional 
is kind of a mulberry bark paper that has a persimmon coating added to it for durability. So the pieces he's using for his stencils are traditional. So when they, when um, the, the, the paste is finished drying, then we had to go back inside the studio and he has these giant vats of indigo sitting in the floor and uh, Brian is holding several pieces that we stenciled at once and dipping them back and forth in the fabric because it takes at least four dye baths of two minutes each to get that beautiful blue color that you see standing on the pieces above you. So these are some of the pieces the students did and then down there on the right we have them all hanging in his backyard drying. So from there, we finished the workshop and we headed down to Kyoto on the bullet train. And the fun part is going shopping for supplies. And there's this department store that's on a side street in Kyoto. It's a second floor of a nondescript building called Tanaka now. And you can see some of the products that you use, these big brushes, the the sticks down there in the bottom left are wrapped and they're called um, Hataji and Shinshi. And they help hold fabric apart on a loom. But it was just like a playland for us to go in there and buy all these products. And the biggest problem we had was we couldn't read Japanese. <laughs> so we fortunately find people to translate for us. And while we were also there, we went to a craft market that meets at a temple complex the last day of the month. And the man on the left is holding a piece of rosemé. And then the one on the right side is a custom, whoops, custom brush maker. He handmade all these brushes. And when you see what I'm doing, you'll see why brushes are very important to me. And then the lady here made her own pieces. And the piece that she's standing in front of the heads of 1500 I ended up buying that is a, a Rosa May bag she cut her own stencil to make those designs and then what you also found a man who taught Rosa May classes and my friend and I who was running the workshop signed up for a one-day work you know it's basically how fast can you create a batik in two hours which is pretty amazing so this is the entrance to his studio. He's another one of a family owned business that's been in uh, process for over 50 years. And the brushes on the left are how the wax is applied. And then down at the bottom there is a, a heating pan with more drawing brushes. And my friend Suzanne, who owns I of Fiber Studio and Stuart and I, she's the one who organized the workshop. So we went and took this class with him. And this is the inside of the studio. On the left side are rolls that were used to uh, press wax into the silk to, for kimono fabric. So when you see designs in kimono fabric and they have these very different patterns, they're usually done with the rollers like that or hand drawn. And he teaches up to 10 people in a, at a time in a class. But I take this monkey with me wherever I travel and I get people to pose with it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the owner and his mother who were running the workshop for us. They barely speak any English, but they loved Mono. But this is a close up of the entrance to their studio. I just thought it was pretty amazing because you're looking at that beautiful blue indigo and then you're looking at the wonderful bamboo screening behind it. So from there, we're coming back to the States and you'll recognize this piece if you, you know, went to the Marco show because this is a close up of me working on the details of the painting. And this is from a photograph I took from my first experience with wash lines in Egypt. And I'm drawing there with a janting tool. I'm doing the detail work with that. And you can see how I'm adding color and layering to get to a final piece. So it's, you can see how the piece is progressing because each color has to be added and then waxed over to preserve it. So I'm building up layer and layer of wax and you can see how by the bottom left, it's almost done and then the right side one is about the final step before I remove the wax. So by the time I pick it up, it stands on its own because I have so much wax on it. And then 
you'll recognize it from the show. There's the finished piece. So these pieces are done on silk. I find I like doing silk rather than cotton. A lot of my friends do cotton, but I like silk because the brightness of the dyes makes it color stand out. And silk can be pretty durable if you hang it up right and treat it right. So that's my thing of choice. Then I've also, just to give you a little bit of background, I showed in 2015 at the Capitol Gallery with my Native American collection. I call this the American Native Collection. And this is all based on historical photographs of the Seminole and Miccosukee Indians. And I did a whole series of work with that and hung there. And then this last year I had the show with another artist at the Alliance for the Arts in Fort Myers. So you, I had, Neil say, I had more work than he did because he was working these very small scale oils, but at least you can get an idea of what my pieces look like when they're displayed on walls. So I, you know, I teach workshops. I'm actually teaching an online workshop this afternoon. <laughs> it's my first online workshop via Zoom. And it's been challenging, but I'm learning. And I thought I would finish this up and show you how I'm applying some of the hot wax. So does anybody have any questions? I think what you're doing is terrific. I, I did it once in Israel. I, I took up a batik uh, workshop and it, I enjoyed it thoroughly, but your command of the colors and what you can uh, get with it, it's stunning, it's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, a lot of years of trial and error. But the tour that you have given us around the world, we want more. It's beautiful. <laughs> really nice. Well, I have plenty more, but I just figured I didn't want to take up too much time with it. But I just wanted to give you an idea what some of my sources for my inspiration are. So um, with that being said, I'm going to uh, turn this. Well, so let's go the other way. All right. So I'm going to try to tilt this down a little bit. Here we go. You can see here I have on my table a piece I started because this is actually a sampler piece that I've been doing uh, with my student who's actually a batik artist herself. She She's Malaysian and she teaches more Malaysian batik and she didn't know anything about Japanese batik. So we, we are swapping off ideas. And... I'm heating up, this is, this is a new tool that is a Malaysian janting. It's a little bit different from an Indonesian janting. And I don't know, let me just test it and see if anything's coming out. There's nothing in that, but I wanted to show you some of these tools because they come in different spouts and sizes. This is more of an Indonesian style. It's actually made in the US, but this is more Indonesian. And here's another one. I have a whole collection of them, especially when you see, look at the Indonesian ones. I brought a couple back that have three little spouts on them. Oops. So uh, let me let me mute. If anyone's um, not muted, it's going to come to them. So let me fix okay. it. Okay. Okay. So they they're different tools, but here's another one of my tools. This is my drawing brush and I'm going to heat it in the hot wax here for a minute while doing that. And you can see here, this is a Japanese pattern that's called snowstorm. So it's basically mm -hmm. hitting little dots onto the fabric. This is drawing with my chanting. Uh, I have another brush here that is called a Japanese process called shiki biki. And it's basically taking a chip brush and cutting and drawing into it so that I draw it through the wax. And I'm going to heat this up as well because I've got a spot here I can do it. And you can see. And the piece over here is uh, stenciling. Let me pull the stencil on so you can see this. I cut the stencil. And then I dab the hot wax through the stencil. And that's what's giving me the pattern here. And I've already put one coat of dye on it. This fun little pattern uh, I discovered by chance this week. This is a cookie cutter. 
and I just dip this in the hot wax and that leaves the ring impression. I have several different sizes here, but I'm gonna just show you a little bit real quick with the shiki beaky because this is a lot of fun. So I'm gonna just take this and you can see how it leads a pattern of hot wax. I'm gonna do a little bit more here. And go like that. So wherever this wax hits the fabric right here, no dye will permeate. So that's why I'm building up layers and layers of wax and dye till I get my final project. And then I have another piece here. I did two pieces that are called wax etchings. And I don't know if you probably can't see this all that well, but this is one I did last night of the Naples Pier. And I'll show you one. This is a completed wax etching. And I drew the seahorse onto the wax fabric like I did on this other one. And to the left, of it, you can see how the shiki beaky pattern comes out after I've dyed it. So these are just little different tools in my drawing box that I use to create different effects. Let me grab another one here. This is a, another waxed etching. And then down here is another stencil pattern. And then you can, see, I'll show you the first piece I did in the one of the award. This is, this is fun. This was uh, done with writ dye and colored crayons. So this is all, dates all the way back to high school. <laughs> so let me tilt this up and you can see a little bit of the wall behind me. And these are part of let's see, my gallery pieces. This piece here is what I call Wash Day Ibarra Bay. And this is silk. And I've um, batiked it and then stretched it on top of a regular canvas. And I've mounted it. And then I've put golden UV on it to protect it. And then above it, you can't really see it. But there's another one that is called the uh, uh, Havana balconies, but these are all part of what I call my wash day series. And uh, they've been the main body of work I've been working on lately. But this past year during the pandemic, I've been doing more collage pieces with indigo dyed newsprint and fabric. Hence, uh, I first started it last year while taking a workshop um, and uh, a friend's studio of Pat Zalisco and Fran Gardner. And Fran was teaching the workshop. So I started playing around with these newspapers I brought back from Japan and creating, I have all sorts of drawers here, creating different patterns and layers that I've experimented with and done a series of these canvases. So they, um, Oh, there you go. You can see this one a little bit better now. You can see it, the, I love the brightness of the dyes on the silk. But the details like this are all drawn on with a brush. And that's the Japanese brush like that. And then if I'm going to dye a piece, I use, I'll take it, you can see this, these brushes. These are, uh, a badger hair brush that I use to push the dye into the fabric. I think I got enough room here. I can show you. I'm, I'll quickly, as I drop this, I'll quickly dye a little bit of this just so you can see how it, it, it hits the wax. Let me just grab. I work in kind of a small space, but I get used to it. It's, so I've got this piece here. I'm going to turn this down again. And I've got some dye made up. And there's another piece here of a turtle. So I'm going to dip my brush in the dye. And I dab this a little bit so I can get the wax out. And 
you can see I push the dye into the wax with a circular motion. And that way I'm getting all my color in. And whatever cracks I have in the fabric that I purposely cracked will show up. And you can see here, it's got this dye on it. So then I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna take another brush. Uh, let's see, let me grab this one. I'm gonna dab some of this off. But then I use this second brush to push the remainder of the dye into the fabric. And clean it up a little bit. So, hopefully you can see that. So you can see the turtle that's on the fabric there. So my next step with this is I'm going to probably put another layer dye on because I want to make sure the color is good and dark. But I will iron the wax out of the piece, the finished piece, and then I have to wrap it up in newsprint. And um, then I have to steam it for two hours. So <laughs> I definitely call this one of those labors of love, but I guess it's because I love what I do. And been doing it for a long time and been teaching it for a few years now and enjoy teaching it. So uh, anybody have any questions? When, when this, you're... Is Shirley, this is Shirley. <laughs> I have a comment. Mm -hmm. when, when I was 12, I went to Pratt on Saturday mornings. And I want to ask you if this was uh, something that predated or came in advance of Batik. I did silk screen. And mm -hmm. somehow what you're doing in a small way we, reminds me of what I did. It was silk fabric and it was indigo blue and we had to make our own pattern, our own screening. And then uh, when it dried, it sat on uh, chicken wire. Mm -hmm. Is this some way related to what you're doing? Was this? Uh, kind of, sort of, but with silk screen, you are cutting a stencil out of a material, adhering the stencil to the silk, and then pressing the color through it. So it's sort of similar to the, when I do a batik stencil, but not quite the same. Okay. And with silk screen, the main thing with silk screen is that you can use the images multiple times versus when you do a thing in batik it's never going to be the same with silk screening you're going to have a more controlled uh content have things look similar all the way through so but batik batik is really a one-of-a-kind kind of thing thank you for that appreciate it your work is <laughs> fantastic <laughs> well, okay i have a question about the detailing because I'm watching you and you're just kind of shoving it in, like you said, but how is it that you get into the minute de detailing where you have the shades and tints and tones and how does, I mean, are you using a different kind of a tool or is that an after process after you're at the, toward the end? Well, how's that well with, the, with the etchings, I'm using a push pin to etch the, literally scratch the design into the waxed fabric. See, I have to wax it both sides. So this is the back side. When I do an etching, I have to wax two sides. But when I do the main piece, I'm primarily doing one side because the silk is thin enough that I can um, see the design. But I have, if I'm doing multiple layers of one color, I have to um, wax it it, put the color down, wax it, dye the next color, wax it, dye it again. It's just like in this one. These are multiple layers. So you can see like, for example, here is the lightest color. I wax that and then I painted this gray over that green to give it a more of a shade. And then I waxed over that. And then I went and added the browns and the darks. So you're really working from light to dark. Crabble, crabble, works amazing, profound. It's a lot like watercolor, you know, it's a lot of watercolor <laughs> process.
That's incredible. How do you, how, when you talked about removing the wax, that was the thing I was surprised by. Um, how do you get it away? Like, like you said, you're going to iron it or you're going to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have an it's iron that's messy. dedicated to nothing but removing wax. Yeah, the whole thing is messy. You have to have a messy space. But, but is that what the reason for the newsprint is, is to, the, to, to be able to, um, to pull it off of it? Yeah, well, I use the newsprint to remove as much wax as I can. And then once I get to that point, I then wrap it in fresh newsprint. I start making it into a jelly roll shape. I don't know. Let me see if I can share the screen. Let's see. Oh, let's see. If you want to share your screen, just make sure it's on the screen first. And then you have to hit share and, and point. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I can't. It's, it's freezing up on me. Ah. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm trying to get this to cancel, but I don't think it's going to cancel. Uh, so anyway, I, I have it. It looks like a... Um, it looks it looks like a big um jelly roll and I can, I can just, that it. won't go yes, yeah you roll, you roll it yeah i roll it and then i put it in a uh, tortilla pot i find that that the height <laughs> i know it's funny i found it a yard set but the height of the tortilla pot um allows me enough freedom for that to move around so, so I have to steam it for two hours, and then I have to wash it to remove any excess dye, and then I can iron it, and then I can mount it. <laughs> yes. oh my gosh. Can I ask you what those would go for? How much you, you know, would like the one behind you, what you would charge? This one, this one I'm charging 2500 for. The big pieces like that run around 2500 and it's not really the price they deserve, but most people... Right are so unfamiliar with batik and they don't understand it. They just think only oil painting should get that kind of price. And it doesn't justify it. it. It really irritates me that people don't understand the process behind it. So I'm, I'm constantly educating people about what is important, how to do batik, why, you know, why my process is still producing a painting. I'm just, you know, people keep thinking batik is a craft medium and it's, you know, I have to educate them and say, no, no, it's it's really an art medium. I produce paintings with it. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say that this um, this in itself is an education. If you want, I can make it a public um, on our channel as opposed to making it private by invitation. It's up to you. Sure, I'd love it. No, so I'd love it. Then that means anybody can click on it and learn more about fatigue and that might draw sure. it. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Be happy to get your permission first. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? If I wanted to take your workshop, what would I need? I send out a complete supply list of what you bring. And then with this online workshop, I send you a package. It costs sixty dollars because that's basically what the supplies cost me, where I send you the dyes, the brushes and the wax, and um, I give you the homework assignment to set it up before starting so that we're on the same page. Plus it saves you some time. Normally when I teach the workshop, I'll be teaching it in April, hopefully, um, at Aya Fiber in Stewart. And when I teach it there, I teach it nine to four for three days because it really, to best justify everything that you do, you need to have the time. I'm just looking here. Let's see if I have any of my Japanese. I don't have it here, but I have my, ja I teach use showing the Japanese shinshi and the, which are the bamboo sticks. I have some actually over in my kitchen, but in order to get over there, I have to pull the cord out. So I have their, their rattan sticks with spikes in the end of it and it holds the silk apart so that it stretches it. So, Cause you can use, um, Canvas stretchers. I have custom made stretchers here. <laughs> These are made so I can hook them together and then tap the silk onto them and stretch them out like they are in the, on the uh, piece down here. 
and then uh, I'll show you another piece. Wait a second. This one, I'm just going to untie real quick. This is a piece that I did during a workshop with Kiranata Sterling Benjamin, who is the instructor who taught me more of the Japanese batik, because she lived in Japan for 18 years. And I had to make three different iterations of a stencil. So I did this one of a seahorse. And you can see the different styles that were done on this panel. And then I had this one hung from a traditional Indonesian carved wood rail. But I find that they work much better when I mount them on the canvas. And that way, I've, I've spent a fortune over the years framing these pieces. And Fran taught me about the UV stuff. So that was a godsend because it completely changed how I could present my work and keep my costs down. So... That led to mounting it like this. This was framed before I took Fran's workshop, but this is after. So I, I'm able to use the gallery wrap canvas and I adhere it with a matte medium. And then I put the uh, golden UV on it. To put it on my... Yeah, so you can see, and it also makes the colors nice and bright too. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I think I think I'm good. If uh, you want to take over, Roberta, and go from there. Uh, go ahead, Matt. Let me check my settings because I lost. Nobody else has a question for Muffy. Or a comment, you can give her a comment. What do you feel about her presentation? Muffy, that was great. I love it. Oh, great, thank you. Thank you. Very impressive. I could watch this over again. I, the your tour of Asia was just mind boggling and your work is just so unique. And the finished product is just, uh, I, I can't even, I have no words right now. It's just wonderful. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Such an education. I knew very little about the cheek, and this is incredible. Oh. <laughs> now so. you know some more. <laughs> I didn't know anything about my cheek. I know 100% more. That's 100% yeah. more I know. <laughs> no, your work is beautiful, and thank you so much for sharing your process. No, oh, my pleasure. Okay, um, is there any other questions? Um, you said you're doing workshops all the time. Do you do them online or in uh, person? I'm just now setting up my online workshop. So I'm trying to get the pricing sorted out for a three-day workshop, which is why I'm doing it right now with my friend from Miami, the, the other uh, petite artist. So she, she teaches regularly online as well. And she's given me a lot of helpful hints about how to teach this workshop online because it's challenging to get all the supplies and the materials for everybody and how am I going to do it and the logistics and learning to use Zoom. So this has been my learning week where I'm learning to use Zoom and learning to teach at the same time. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. What, what makes yours so unique is that I've seen Batik in terms of just stenciling like objects and, and images but you create entire artworks out mm -hmm. of them. And that's what makes your work so unique. Well, that's what I've always tried to do. I just thought, you know, batik is just so much more than just doing objects and things. So, um, Do you yeah. think you could get a workshop up for a bunch of us? Sure. Well, this is kind of like a workshop, but. <laughs> no, an actual do it. Yeah. 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 Well, the biggest problem again we'll be getting you the supplies setting up a you know setting up a day if you guys can come up with a set of dates and then um you know i'd have my supply fee and a workshop fee so it's just a matter of because i really need three days if not four days especially these i've been teaching this online class in a 90 minute session so um three 90 minute sessions so I'm finding that I'm getting most of it done, but there'll be homework that you have to do beforehand, like making uh, 
a soy milk mixture to put on the silk so it absorbs the dye, plus mm -hmm. teaching you how to make the dyes. I mean, there's lots of little steps. So that's why I'm trying right now to do, um, you know, get this sorted out before I really put it out there so everybody can do it. But again, I w I'll be teaching three-day class in January at the Naples Art Association in Naples. I'm, I'm signed up and I'm supposed to be teaching in February at the Alliance for the Arts for three days in Fort Myers. And then in April, I'll be teaching at Eye of Fiber. And I've got to put the links up on my website. But if you go to the my mcgilltropicalart.com website, I have a tab there on workshops. And I'll be putting up more information there as I get it all set up. Okay. okay. And can I get everybody to give me a light smile before I shot on your screenshot? Annika? <laughs> smile. <laughs>